Kia ora. welcome to episode 68 of the SWNZ podcast, the podcast for New Zealand Star Wars fans. My name is Matt. And my name is Christy. It was a huge week for news from a galaxy far, far away, so we're going to jump in and talk a lot about Star Wars today. The notes we've got for this podcast are quite extensive, so it's going to be a bit of a meandering journey, I think, so so bear with us, we've got a lot to work through. In fact, because it's May the 4th, Star Wars Day in New Zealand today, and May the 4th in the Northern Hemisphere, in North America in particular, Tomorrow we're going to do a follow-up part two podcast tomorrow that we'll be that we'll be referring to as part two of Star Wars Day basically because as well as all the things that have been happening in the last week or so and happening locally today we're expecting quite a bit of interesting news to come out of America and the official sites tomorrow. Of course, May the 4th is the sort of unofficial, now quite official uh, Star Wars Day celebrated all over the world. So if you like to celebrate Star Wars Day in your own way, whether you play video games, you wear a t-shirt, you like to watch a movie or two in the evening, however you like to celebrate Star Wars Day, be sure to jump into the SWNZ Facebook group and share what you're doing today to celebrate Star Wars with other fans. I always really enjoy seeing what people do. Some people bake Star Wars cookies. Cookies. Some people sort of do puzzles or build Lego sets. There's all sorts of really fun uh, ways to celebrate Star Wars, big or small. So yeah, it's a good excuse. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're going to run through our news roundup about, in particular, live action material that's in production as a starting point. We'll move on to some product reports and some local store reports. One thing that sort of leads our news roundup because it's a Star Wars day. The Disney Gallery behind the scenes Star Wars The Book of Boba Fett documentary, uh, which we were kind of expecting to show up on Disney Plus Day, is actually already out for New Zealanders on Disney Plus. So if, if you're a subscriber with that streaming service, do a search for Disney Gallery or Book of Boba Fett. There is a 62 minute behind the scenes documentary that you can check out right now. We haven't watched it yet, but we will be doing so this evening, New Zealand time, and we'll probably talk about it in tomorrow's podcast. Now, everyone's excited that the Obi-Wan Kenobi series is just a matter of weeks away. And uh, there's been a few interesting little bits of information that have been coming out over the last week or so that just gives us some some thoughts to discuss about what to expect from this. One thing that's stood out in the past week or so is that there's been some leaked promotional banners. These are the sort of things that we've shown up in stores promoting products related to Kenobi. Interesting that Darth Vader actually features quite prominently in them as well as Obi-Wan Kenobi, of course. Interesting interesting that Hasbro and such like, uh, like I say, featuring Darth Vader in such, such a prominent way, emphasizing him. I don't know if that necessarily correlates to how much he, he will be present in the series, but it's interesting that from a marketing point of view, he is giving a headline position to the same extent that Ewan McGregor's Obi-Wan Kenobi is. Considering how very little they've kind of really revealed in through official channels about about Hayden's participation in the series, it's interesting that they are just openly using Vader in promotional materials. It sort of feels like Lucasfilm wants sort of the, the return of Vader to be dramatic and sort of impactful. So having him on just sort of banners in the toy aisle kind of feels like we're sort of jumping back to the sort of episode three era where Vader was like everywhere because we all knew he was in it. We'd seen him everywhere. So it's kind of a little bit interesting. I feel like maybe for some people they wanted to have that sort of first experience preserved, sort of seeing him. We didn't really know if Hayden was going to be Vader in this series. There were some discussions early on about whether maybe we'll see some flashbacks between Obi-Wan and Anakin, you know, Obi-Wan spending some time sort of thinking Thinking back to uh, their bond, their mm. sort of relationship in the prequels, we didn't necessarily know that it was going to be Vader. You know, some some concept artwork was sort of leaking out there from some of the sort of early sort of um, shareholder footage and things yeah. like that. But seeing Vader so prominently leaked really does. Well, yeah, um, we're now at the point where the PR teams are using Vader's mm, presence and appearance yeah. as a as a straight up hook. Um, into, into the series for me personally it is it is quite the hype like it's, I think it's, it's cool it's pulling me way back to like 2005 you know the Anakin versus Obi-Wan fight it was everywhere it was you know Kenobi versus Vader and stuff like that and you know that yes there's Yoda there's Order 66 and everything else that went on in that film but that was just felt like such the pinnacle we knew that that clash was coming so it's it is building up anticipation but I do understand that some fans I guess wish 
weren't knowing as much going into this. Yeah, yeah. Like I say, I think it's a worthwhile hook and it does hark back to the marketing of, of previous installments in, in the Star Wars universe. On that note, quite a few different outlets have been interviewing both you and Anne Hayden about the show, both often appearing up at the same level again, which is interesting mm. that they're given that. Obviously, it's you and McGregor's series, but um, they're really pushing on the topic of Hayden's presence and role in the series. So both you and Anne Hayden have been interviewed about about how it felt getting back into the show and into the characters. Entertainment Weekly, EW.com, for instance, talked to Ewan, and he said that in terms of preparing for the series, he went back and watched all nine of the saga films. Interesting that he mentioned that he hadn't watched the prequels before, and he went further to read some other science fiction in general. Ian M. Banks is a Scottish science fiction writer, and Ewan says that he started reading his science fiction novels. He didn't do that sort of thing the first time around with his involvement in Star Wars. He did absolutely, he says, study Alec Guinness and watch the original three Star Wars films when they did, you know, when he was first involved in the prequels, but he didn't really think about or explore the genre. He says, it's not something I would normally do, but this time I did. I got jazzed about being back in space because I really love it as a movie watcher. Total Film also separately spoke to him, and this bit's a little bit interesting. He said, if we were to get an opportunity to do it again, I'd totally be up for that. It's uh, like I'm trying to be knocking on Disney's door again. We, at this point, the, the official word is that this is a limited series, not season one of an ongoing production. There is hope. There is you know, potential, theoretical potential for a subsequent season, one way or another, because Obi-Wan will have a series of adventures during his time on Tatooine, I imagine. I mean, if you follow the sort of hype for the Kenobi series online, this thing could, like outshine the mandalorian it could do massive numbers and if disney sees like a new star wars sort of series doing above and beyond what baby yoda did mm. you know and the mandalorian they could just be like yes more of that especially with the rivalry between sort of disney plus and netflix with netflix having Ooh, sort of yeah, some it's, negative it's press battle, yeah. recently if disney could see the opportunity to seize in and really claim the throne of a streaming service by yeah, like some putting some more more stuff well. out there um, that, that I don't I don't think it would come down to oh should we do it they'll just be like yep here's here's our checkbook let's go bring us more subscribers so it's fun to see that Ewan is up for it again he's had a bit of an ongoing relationship with Disney in recent years he uh, played a character in the live action uh, Beauty and the Beast he was in the Christopher Robin one so it's he's done stuff with Disney he's friends with them and it's keen to see that he is really getting into Star Wars and science fiction and doesn't seem to be shy about saying that he wants to do more so that's very very exciting so Hayden's also spoken a couple of times recently about playing Vader again he mentioned in an interview that he, that he binged the Star Wars animated shows the Clone Wars and the Rebels and I find this particularly interesting because he says they did a lot with these characters a lot with Darth Vader in those shows and they did further explore the relationship between Obi-Wan and Vader there was interesting stuff there to learn about. It was great fun getting to go back and reimmerse yourself in this world that just continues to grow and become more and more vast. I find that personally extremely interesting to know that he went to the lengths to understand all the material about the relationship between Kenobi and Vader that has taken place but since his involvement in the prequel trilogy. Yeah, I mean, they already had a really sort of really interesting relationship in the prequel movies that was explored a little bit in some of the novels that came out around that time. But you can't really do a live action series that dives into the complicated relationship between Anakin slash Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi without watching or knowing the sort of the dynamic that's really shown there in the Clone Wars. Yeah. And obviously Rebels has a little bit of Vader and an old obi-wan in there as well so i i really do appreciate when when actors coming into star wars not that he's coming in this time but there's been a lot of content produced since he was there so he's doing his homework doing his research making sure that he's making informed artistic choices with his performance that because you know that the fans they read every little subtle thing the little eyebrow tweaks the way that the, the way that characters are sort of re 
uh, react, interact, all that sort of stuff. You know that the fans really hone down on the subtlest of performances. So I, I really appreciate that, that these actors are taking the time to inform themselves so much and so that it aligns a lot closely. So it doesn't feel sort of jarring and we're like, well, yeah, but he went through this and that Clone Wars episode. So I don't think you'd act that way. So it's, it's really good to hear that he's done that. Oh, it makes me so superb. excited yeah. for his performance. Yeah. Uh, and talking to Total Film Magazine, Hayden, said the following when george lucas had brought me onto the prequels it was to play anakin he gets knighted as darth vader towards the end and for a couple of scenes i got to put on the suit but my journey with the characters was with anakin skywalker but the character he's such a complex character and now getting to explore the mindset and emotional state of darth vader has been a lot of fun that's that's a specifically important statement i think that Mm. we will see and hear more about darth vader and Darth Vader's journey as well as Obi-Wan's journey. I think if we get even just a small bit of exploration of that, you know, what's going on in the early Darth Vader's mind, uh, then it will really fill some interesting gaps in the lore and, and chronology. On the topic of Darth Vader, and this, again, I keep using the word interesting, we, uh, we, we do in our podcasts, he was asked specifically whether James Earl Jones will voice Darth Vader in the upcoming Disney Plus series. Hayden replied simply in no comment. Now, uh, I think that's pretty much giving away that James Earl Jones will be involved. I guess that's no surprise at all, but it is nice to hear. I can imagine that the, if if the time comes when James Earl Jones is on his deathbed, that uh, Disney will be up there getting him to record some just random Darth Vader lines because I don't think anybody wants to to envision the time when Darth Vader is voiced by somebody that is not James Earl Jones. No, they'll, series, they'll get yeah. they'll get like you know they'll have him come in for Kenobi and just read every word so you can do some sort of like Alexa type you know cobbled together. They have all the data like what they did but with Mark like, Hamill yeah. for. Luke, you know, they kind of, they get the AI to sort of analyze it so that it's like they can recreate just about any word with all of the data and the recording sure. footage they have. I'm sure they're doing something like that for James Earl Jones so that, so even even after he is no longer with us, they can continue to sort of credit him because um, it's hard to imagine anyone else really doing that, especially in live action productions. One bit of slightly left field trivia that's been floating around over the last 24 hours is that the actor Flea from Red Hot Chili Peppers, actor and musician, will be making a cameo appearance in Obi-Wan Kenobi. And this is a little bit fun because he has worked in a George Lucas affiliated production before he was in the second installment of Back to the Future. And this is a plausible rumor because Deborah Chow, who's the showrunner for Obi-Wan Kenobi, actually directed one of the recent Red Hot Chili Peppers music videos. Finally, in Obi-Wan Kenobi news, we have learnt, and it's been well uh, published online, that the composer from the Loki series, Natalie Holt, has been confirmed as the composer for Obi-Wan Kenobi. This information has come via Vanity Fair. We knew that John Williams was creating the Obi-Wan Kenobi theme, but as with the Book of Boba Fett, we have a partnership between the creator of the theme and the rest of the scoring, so Natalie Holt will be the composer for the rest of the score for Obi-Wan Kenobi. She talked about the work she did for this. She said there's quite a few dark side characters in this series. In fact, she was asked, there's quite a few dark side characters in this series. We have Inquisitors in the show and Darth Vader turns up. What instruments are best for conveying dark side themes? She says, well, there's the hunting horn. There's that sound that's just uh, shudders. You hear it and it just does something. It stirs your guts. It's so haunting. And I was working with Brian Kilgore, the percussionist, who's got these incredible unusual instruments. It's that jarring rhythmic texture that we've been playing around with. I'll focus on that point specifically because it does kind of talk to the tone that we might be seeing in Obi-Wan Kenobi. Uh, they really be focusing on the dark side characters, the dark side lore and the dark side experience and trying to emphasize that through through the score. Yeah, it makes me uh, sort of reflect back on that line that Obi-Wan gives in A New Hope, where he sort of talks about before the dark times, that that is his way of kind of referencing that time after Order 66 and, and, you know, before sort of the rebellion started to find its legs and stuff like that. It was the dark time for him, you know. So it's really interesting to hear just how much sort of uh, the dark side and sort of darkness is going to be in this series. I hope it's not going to be like we know it's going to be dark because this Kenobi 
uh, series, it can't show anything sort of like, it's not going to have a happy ending as such. We know the fate of Vader and Obi-Wan, and that is covered in later films. We're not really going to get them sort of winning or becoming best friends or anything like that in this series. So it's going to be interesting to see how they balance out the likes of, you know, the Jedi hunters, the Inquisitors going out and just murdering people all the time and, and how they're going to sort of just not make it a, just a, you know, a just hours worth of depressing Jedi killing. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by the dark side. I think it's really fun. I'm certainly looking forward to like the Acolyte series and stuff like that and really sort of diving into that because a lot of the movies are from the rebellion, the Jedi's point of view. We don't, we see the Sith, we see what they're doing, but it's not from their point of view. So it'll be really interesting when we get to those sort of uh, contents, but it'll be interesting to see from the trailer, we get some sort of inquisitor meetings and things like that. Mm. So it'd be interesting to see how much from the dark side perspective will we get, you know, things with Vader and the Inquisitors and then we switch over here to Kenobi and yeah, kind yeah. of go backwards and forwards. Not everything about the show is going to be from Kenobi's perspective. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see how they kind of balance that and work with the dark side versus light side when obviously during the height of the Empire, the dark side is very much in control. So I'm really, really keen to hear this music. It sounds fascinating from her descriptions. All right, so like I say, only a matter of weeks until we see Kenobi streaming on Disney+. Plus. That's going to hit uh, the platform on May the 27th, Friday, May the 27th. Moving on to talk about the Acolyte series. Filming on the Acolyte has now been delayed until October of this year. It will continue through to May of next year. So we won't be expecting to see that series until late 2023 at the earliest. There's been a little bit of additional information in addition to the fact that we know that a lead by the name character name of Aura, who is being played by Amanda Sternberg, there have been some casting calls that have gone out to give us some clues as to some of the other significant roles in this series. New casting calls include a call for a Caucasian man in his 50s to play a character whose working name is Paul, described as a series regular and as of now, it seems that this character will only be a part of the series for one season. They're also looking for a younger girl, 8 to 10 years old, to play a character whose name at this point is Miri. Miri is described as a lead guest star. And it's inter- interestingly, it sounds like Lucasfilm might actually be looking for identical twins. Not a lot of information here, but it just gives us a feel for the breadth of characters that will be involved in this series, which has been described as a bit of a mystery thriller and which has a relationship to the High Republic material. And we're looking forward to that uh, that variety, that distinction from the other sort of productions that we're seeing these days. If anything, as I've said before in previous podcasts, I'm always just excited to know that things are progressing Mm. on some of these series. We got that barrage of new titles sort of announced what feels like years ago now, and we're sort of finally getting some traction, getting some sort of progress. So it's a little slow. These are obviously really early sort of cryptic descriptions. It's not going to, you know, give away any spoilers or even character names. We know these are just sort of placeholder titles. I I guess that's why I would bring them up, even though they're just sound bites of information. It is conveying that, that things are ticking along in the background in this way yeah i know that generally if things are going to get cancelled it's done before you get to the casting stage um you know things kind of stall in that pre-production when they're trying to you know really fine tune scripts and stuff like that i know things like with the indiana jones franchise it always seems to stall at the script stage you know they're not going to move forward unless they've got a script that they really work with so once you get to the casting stage and you know yes filming has been delayed but that's still on schedule. Like they've still in got terms, it on the book. In terms of the rest yeah. of the production schedule, yeah, yeah, that'll fit in. Now the Ahsoka series, on the other hand, has just started production. It started in LA at the end of April, and there have in fact been some leaked set photos that let us know that you know things are very solidly happening in terms of in terms of filming. The other news related to the Ahsoka series is that. Peter Ramsey has been tapped as a director of one of the episodes of Ahsoka, one or more episodes of Ahsoka. He was the co-director of Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse and has done a few other titles, such as the second unit director of the 1998 version of Godzilla. So coming in from a Marvel production, uh, interesting to hear who's going to be involved in that series and what sort of flavors, think about what sort of flavors that might bring. Yeah, I'm not getting too into spoilers on this one. Um, I do... I'm sort of, I don't know why some of the, some of the series I'm like, I want to know everything and others I'm kind of sitting on the sidelines going, I'll wait and see. 
I have seen some of the spoilers for this one. It's looking really cool. I'm hoping that we get some more concrete information. I, I know obviously they got to finish filming before we even get a trailer. So I'm, it's highly unlikely we're going to get really anything concrete at Celebration, which is, you know, at the end of the month. But yeah, exciting to know that filming is, is going. Sets are, sets are there. You know, people are working. It's very exciting. Yeah. And finally, let's talk about Andor. Andor is the series that will be showing up after Obi-Wan Kenobi this year. And we're actually expecting slash hoping to be seeing some footage, a trailer of some sort from this very soon, potentially from the early days of celebration coming up in a few weeks time. Andor's director of photography, Andriano Goldman, in an interview for a Brazilian TV channel, interestingly says that the series he worked on, speaking of Andor, was supposed to initially be five seasons long, but he thinks that it's probably been cut down to about three seasons. He says that with a degree of uncertainty, but either way, it's, I guess in some ways we take the opposite perspective. It's nice to know that we might be getting up to three seasons of Andor. We knew that we're going to be getting season two. That was kind of leaked by Stellan Skarsgård when he sort of mentioned that filming for Andor season two would be taking place in the Northern Hemisphere autumn of this year. So if the other bit related to that production is that the season two of filming will begin in November, late in the year. So that's kind of end of end of spring, New Zealand time, uh, November at Al Street in England. Production is supposedly going to be running for 18 months at this point. We knew that season one filmed for approximately nine months. So this does raise the question, will season two and three be filmed back to back? So and hopefully released with you know a slightly shorter window between them. Yeah, the long production runtime. I know sometimes if you're filming on sets and out in the wild, it tends to you know not be quite as uh, efficient as filming on controlled sets. Yeah, nine, nine where you months can is sort of, quite long for a yeah, season, but, but eight, that's quite long. So I'm I'm hoping really for, does imply two seasons. For, and also just that sort of nine month filming production. I'm hoping that means that we get a a good chunky amount of episodes and they are the sort of the 45 to an hour length you know some of the some of the recent series have been a little on the shorter side of episodes i know that the technically these are all longer than movies so hey we're getting more star wars for our buck having series but there's just something about really getting into a series sometimes it feels like when we watch star wars we're just getting into it it's awesome having this weekly star wars and then it's over yeah. and then we're like no, back to no star wars for a while the end of seasons will be longer than mm. book of boba fett and Man. So it's exciting to see that, you know, a, a production run of 18 months, that's 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 a lot of Star Wars to be filming. That's really exciting. And yeah, yeah I, it would be sad if they've decided to cut it down from five to three. But we, but never, sometimes, we didn't know, actually. No. We didn't know. We knew that season two was coming. We didn't even know certainly that season three was coming. So it's not like it feels like something's been taken away from us. It feels like we're, it feels, something's been given to us at season three, effectively. I don't mind... If season if series are short because they are constructed to be that way, yeah. sometimes you feel like like uh, with television series they're just getting into their stride and then they get cancelled and then the kind of the flow of the story never gets to successfully complete. If they know they have a story end to end that they want to tell and they plot it out in three seasons, it will have a it will have a satisfying conclusion. Well, we won't be feel like we're missing the anything. One, then they have to yes. wrap it up. Yes, exactly. You know, you don't want to stretch it out needlessly and just kind of make Star Wars episodes for the sake of it but you also want it to sort of feel like it came to a conclusion you know like the Clone Wars the animated series was kind of cancelled before we really got to see everything that Dave Filoni and his team really had in their mind but we finally got the the Clone Wars season seven we finally kind of got that closure we got the sort of the ending that 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 they originally sort of wanted to portray and it was worth the wait. So I'm hoping that they have a really nicely written three season arc story to tell us. And yeah, I'm, I'm sure they've got just oodles of other Star Wars stories to tell. So we might not get five seasons of Ander, but we'll get seasons of other things. At this point, we don't really know how much Ahsoka we might get, you know, if that's a limited series or, or I mean, the High Republic series will end up yeah. going. Anything could be, I mean, technically anything could be greenlit for a second season if it does well enough on Disney+. Plus. You know, I, I Disney's got 
pretty deep pockets. They can throw money at anything that brings them success if they really, really want to. People used to make all sorts of rumors about how much they paid some of the Avengers actors to get them to keep coming back, you know, because the Avengers made so much money. They didn't, Disney didn't care about paying these actors obscene paychecks to get them to come back because they know it will just keep making them money. And, and the yeah. streaming battles are certainly firing that up a bit. Just to emphasize what you're saying, yeah, I'm not too stressed about the fact that this might only be three seasons and because there's so much production in the work and I'm just enjoying that the different stories for different characters are being, being told. Looking forward in particular to hearing more about Lando and uh, where that character and the actors involved in that will end up going. Finally, just still talking about a Disney Plus series, but this information is also about Star Wars Celebration because it comes via the Celebration panel schedule. But a little bit of information has been revealed about the recently leaked Tales of the Jedi series. On Saturday, May the 28th, America time, so Sunday New Zealand time, there is a panel about the Tales of the Jedi series, and this lets us know that what we're going to be looking about is actually an animated anthology shorts, a series of animated anthology shorts. So Tales of the Jedi will be a series, will be animated, and the panel does involve Dave Filoni. So Dave Filoni has an involvement in this series. That's about all we know of Tales of the Jedi at this point, apart from the, the leaked logo. But uh, that, that, that gives us quite a bit of information about what to expect, not live action and not a one-off. Generally, if you're going to do a main stage celebration panel, they have to bring pictures. There mm. has to be something to put up on that big screen to show all of the people that queued a long time to get into that room. They don't just want to be told about it. I mean, just about all of the main stage panels. You go, you queue up for hours. Yeah, they, they always have you camp out because you know you're going to be rewarded by seeing something cool. Yeah. They're going to show you a trailer, some concept footage, you know, um, you know, concept art. Dave Filoni draws a lot. I'm sure he's going to have all sorts yeah, of concept art really that they point. can put him up. So we're going to get a much better feel for what this is going to take in terms of the storytelling and, and the style. And it's going to, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, no, that, that is a really good point. Uh, this is appearing on the, the celebration stage, the main stage of the celebration event. It will be streamed to other stages because they're expecting overflow. But like you say, typically they have a, a an interviewer and a guest sitting in front of large screen panels that inevitably they always you know show some relevant information on and given that tales of the jedi doesn't necessarily tie into other specific existing characters or productions you're going to have to reveal reveal some of the the new new material that we can expect to see in this especially since this will be streamed to two other stages yep, so like they are anticipating three whole sort of rooms full rooms large full rooms, of people rooms, that yeah. want to get in on this so it's going to be they're going to have something really cool because they're hyping it up they don't they generally don't stream the the sort of standard panels to other rooms no. they're just just for the people in that room so this has got to be something hot yep. to make you want to go to it Okay, let's move on to talk about Star Wars gaming news. Lego the Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga continues to do well. It reportedly topped 3.2 million copies sold in its initial two weeks, which is just you know good news for the most recent and most visible Star Wars uh, game that we've sort of seen in recent times. Via StarWars.com, we have had some information, well, scant information, but oh, for a new game that will be coming via Skydance New Media, uh, helmed by Amy Hennig. It's described as a narrative-driven action-adventure game featuring original story in the Star Wars galaxy. Now, Skydance previously were purportedly being working on some sort of game that was cancelled, so there is a presumption that this newly announced video game is in fact a revival of Hennig's cancelled Star Wars game, which was codenamed Project Ragtag. If that is true, then we'll be looking at something that is based in the post A New Hope era, in the original trilogy era, and it's going to involve a male mercenary lead and an ensemble cast, multiple planets, including Tatooine, Jabba the Hutt, mining operations in the Alderaan graveyard field. Quite an interesting sort of point in time and nice that it's tying into those original trilogy locations if that in fact pans out so that didn't come from the official announcement that came from a bit of digging done by others on the internet but yeah a story driven game is, is very welcome from my point of view star wars galaxy of heroes tell us the latest on that one 
Yep. Well, just like most app games that have some sort of in-game event and stuff like that, to celebrate May 4th, Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes is introducing a new character as a reward to the Conquest game mode. This is where you play against sort of the AI, not other players. And as you progress, you can unlock chests that contain shards for a particularly powerful character, something that's sort of ranking over a marquee character. Not quite Galactic Legend, though they do take a very, very long time to earn so they are well worth it. The character that is going to be unlocking for May the 4th is Darth Malgus. He is the sort of the big bad main Sith character in Star Wars The Old Republic. Galaxy of Heroes developer has said that they are doing this in conjunction with Bioware. They kind of did Mm. it as a collab to celebrate Star Wars The Old Republic's 10th anniversary, which of course Technically, it was in December, but uh, sort of t- all along officially said that that 10th anniversary will be celebrated all be year, year long. Year long yeah. So this is tying into that, and that's really fun. There are other characters from Star Wars: The Old Republic already in this game, notably the Sith Trooper, Sith uh, Acolyte, and the Assassin. Now, those are sort of not really sort of named characters, but they will be part of the sort of Sith Empire squad that will work alongside Malgus, alongside, of course, the very powerful Darth Malak and Darth Revan and the Dark Side Bastila characters they will all cohes- cohesively work together of course those characters are from Knights of the Old Republic which is in the same era as as Swotor so this is very very exciting uh, the word on the street is is that he's looking like he is going to be an absolute beast in the game um, it's going to take me a long time to play I am not that sort of real top tier Kraken player that is spending a lot of money on this game to unlock everything first try but I am definitely going to be upping my sort of input here to try and unlock Melgus as soon as I can because he looks amazing and he is one of my favorite characters from Star Wars The Old Republic he's one of those characters that has kind of transcended their original form from the video game he is popular beyond it you don't need to play Star Wars The Old Republic to be aware of Melgus he is very prominent in the incredible cinematic trailers for that game and he has expanded into the merchandise line. There is a 12 inch figure, there is a premium format uh, Sideshow even did a life size statue of him that yeah. you could technically buy. Action figures t-shirts, there's all sorts of merchandise for him because he is a very very cool character he's like Darth Revan, he's kind of a central character in the original video game where they were sort of invented but they are so ca- so popular with fans they kind of go beyond that and get drawn into other sort of media so I'm very very excited to see him brought into Galaxy of Heroes, one of my favorite app games that I play regularly. So very exciting news there. And just rounding out Star Wars gaming news, not a topic we specifically have a lot of experience with, but for the sake of completeness, I'll mention that Star Wars Day is going on right now in the multi-platform game Fortnite. Between May the 3rd, i.e. now, until May the 17th, all Star Wars items from years past are currently unvaulted. So you will have access to lightsabers, E11 weapons, Stormtrooper training in the quest options, a new Empire banner, and every non-battle pass Star Wars outfit that's been in the item shop will make an intergalactic comeback, they tell us, via the Epic Games website press release. Just bringing things back to a little bit more of a local flavor, the Armageddon Expo Auckland, which will be taking place June the 10th to the 12th. Organizers have put out a recent press release, just reminding us, of course, that this is our the 100th Armageddon event in New Zealand. They're describing it as being unlike anything New Zealand has ever seen, taking place at the Auckland Showgrounds. And a little bit of Star Wars relevance here. Attendees will be able to enjoy a huge range of in-show attractions, including the Cosplay Parade, Chili Eating Challenge, Squid Game-inspired competitions, and in particular, a life-size Star Wars-like racing pod and more. We don't have a lot of information beyond that, but I'm kind of intrigued by that marketing hook and uh, to see what they're actually referring to in terms of this this pod racer. Even if there aren't Star Wars guests like this event, there's always a good Star Wars flavor to Armageddon's. It's been a sort of a, a constant uh, sort of fixture on the calendar for Auckland and other centres for going and enjoying the Star Wars shopping. Not, not dominating the shopping, there's, but there's always a good sort of uh, representation there from different from different vendors and of course the costuming clubs the 501st and the rebel legion always have some presence there most of the time there's a stand so you can go and meet characters and get your photos taken so i'm really looking forward to getting out there and sort of connecting with fans again and that pod racing life-size 
item sounds <laughs> really interesting. Here? I'm very keen to see what this is going to be like. Yeah, um, I don't actually know how it's come from. Hmm, yeah. All right. One last little bit of news that we're just going to tack on in here, and it's kind of ties into the convention theme but it also ties into all that sort of live action material we were talking about earlier on is that recently in america a convention the iccc the imperial commissary collectors con ian mcdermott made a, an appearance and on the topic of wanting to reprise his role of the of emperor palpatine he says there's a certain show coming up soon set right around the time and may have considered to be i may have been considered to be very active whether or not you will see my physical body, I cannot comment, but you will certainly feel my presence. He could, in fact, be referring to any of Kenobi, Bad Batch, or, or Andor in terms of having some sort of role. I'll just leave that there, and we'll see how that pans out in the future. The way he came on stage after the Rise of Skywalker trailer aired at Star Wars Celebration, I always get a feel that Ian takes a certain amount of sort of glee with with playing Emperor Palpatine. Every time he sort of gets the 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 chance to kind of come back and portray him, I always he he seems to sort of convey uh, that he really does enjoy it. So I think. Like not reading too much into this, I do hope you know. Any time you see Vader, you kind of think of of Palpatine because they kind of go hand in hand through most of the original trilogy era. Because you know, Vader sort of dies trying to destroy him on the Death Star. So I always well, think of them together. So, uh, like I said, I, I didn't want to delve too too much in this, but let's just a shade because yeah, in Kenobi, we're talking about. We're talking about Emperor Palpatine, but even in Andor, he could make an appearance in any one of those series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because obviously, any time in sort of the Galactic Empire between Episode Three and Episode Four is kind of the height of Palpatine's power when he is basically controlling the galaxy. So when he says, uh, "At the time, I was considered to be very active," so I would say in that kind of time period, or or whether he's, I don't know. I don't know if he means active in terms of just doing stuff or active physically. It's kind of interesting. I like, think he just means active in terms of power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which which all three of these things is kind of set in that 20-year block. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, it's kind of, when you think about it, it's hard to make a lot, like, three series worth of content in this time period and not acknowledge the Emperor in, in some set, way. Yeah. He's going to have to... Yeah show up in conversations yeah. some character is going to mention the emperor because yeah. he is the big bad at the top of the pyramid so yeah i didn't even really because i mean maybe maybe they have been trying to distract us with vader for kenobi to kind of hide the fact that oh yeah we've actually got a secret other returning character that's going to blow your mind as well, well because i don't, I don't who, think he'll have a big role Oh, no, good. but that would still be really, really dramatic. We yeah. don't see him a lot in The Rise of Skywalker, but his appearance there is very impactful. It's a big deal that he's there. You know, he is he is the big sort of the boss at yeah. the end of at the end of the movie to do the the so big battle with. I don't so. think the discussion is too spoilery because no. there's a lot of places he could show up, and it really is just in many ways expected because that's what's going on in, in the galaxy. But uh, yeah, always exciting to hear about actors reprising their Star Wars roles on an ongoing basis. Well, Disney seems to be really uh, in on the fact that fans love it when they bring back characters, that they stay true to the actor that portrayed them in years past. So if you're going to do anything in the modern era, Ian is certainly a lot more involved in the Star Wars fandom than he ever has been. It felt like he would never turn up to celebrations, and then all of a sudden he's doing back-to-back -back celebration appearances and doing other conventions. Yep. You know, so it sort of feels like... He's fully in, involved and invested in the Star Wars fandom, making Star Wars content. So, I mean, we've probably all thought about whether he would show up in any of these series because it's set around that time period. But this is just a, a very exciting tease. Even if we just sort of see like like some stormtroopers watching some sort of imperial broadcast bulletin and it's got sort of Palpatine giving some sort of, you know, little speech to his troops or something like that, you know, broadcast over a little hologram or something like that. I would just love little touches like that. It doesn't even need to be him walking down, you know, talking to inquisitors or something like no. that, you know, just little touches touches just to remind you that this is that tied this is, into the bigger yes, picture that this is where where palpatine is 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 king so let's just move around a bit and talk about some store reports and product announcements there's going to be a lot more tomorrow in terms of new products i think 
some of those are starting to be made visible and it's hard to know exactly to what extent they'll be available easily locally. I'm excited by the fact that Hot Toys very recently teased that they're going to be celebrating the Attack of the Clones 20 year anniversary and specifically, interestingly, they're using the same logo that Celebration is using. So this looks like an official broader marketing logo pertaining to the 20th anniversary of Attack of the Clones that has a profile uh, clone trooper helmet and that Hot Toys teaser implied that we would be getting 12 inch 1 6 scale figures of both R2D2 and C3PO in there as they sort of made an appearance in Attack of the Clones which is a bit of an interesting variation on all the other versions that we've seen out there and we're hoping for some other characters from Attack of the Clones celebrating that, that movie in particular. Some years ago, back when San Diego Comic-Con was still held in person in its full capacity, they revealed in person a full 12-inch Padme Amidala figure from her sort of Geonosis outfit from Attack of the Clones. And if you dig up that on the Sideshow website, it still just has this picture and sort of saying coming soon and you can sort of sign up for alerts and that hit page has been there for years so i wonder whether somebody told them to sort of press pause on that and wait until they could sort of include it in attack of the clones sort of celebration so fingers crossed for me i'm really hoping that we finally get some word on when this figure is going to be finally available to order it's finally going to make its way into the into the public because there is very little in the way of padme figures in a 12 inch scale sideshow many years ago did the sort of animated micro series Ilum snowsuit version of uh, Padme and that's the only 12 inch Padme figure out there of course there are other versions Hasbro did the sort of dolls from Phantom Menace but there isn't really in the modern era especially from the likes of Hot Toys with their beautiful face sculpts and attention to detail so I'm really hoping we get some characters that haven't really been celebrated much there are lots of Jedi characters all sorts of variations of Kenobi and Anakin and and other sort of characters around there we could get a really cool sort of episode 2 Palpatine and things like that there could be some really fun characters in here that haven't really been given a lot in the way of merchandise in recent years yeah okay talking about Star Wars Lego there's a few points to hit on just here If you look around at the moment in celebration of Star Wars Day, many, many retailers of Star Wars Lego have discounts on Star Wars Lego sets at this point. 10% via the market, a number of retailers there. Uh, Mighty App, I believe, has some discounts on Star Wars Lego sets, up to about 15% on some of those. Now, no, those aren't big big reductions, but Lego sets, any reduction on Lego is a little bit bit rare, and it's never quite at the really high level um, because of the way Lego operates. So those 10 to 15% can make a difference on any set that's over over $100. Check those out by looking at the places you usually source Lego, and we'll be putting a few links down below. The official Lego site, lego.com, the New Zealand uh, version of it, recently had a little bit of an interesting situation. The UCS land speeder finally came out. That the VIP members had early access to that on the 1st of May. In celebration of May the 4th, they are giving away gifts with purchases. We have the Lars Homestead with a Baru Lars minifig um, and also a Beskar block keyring that were available through at when you, if you made purchases that hit specific thresholds via lego.com. Um, that's a really good deal and those are still available. Slight hiccups when they launched that on May the 1st that we were there to see because the newest products, the sort of uh, dioramas, the Trench Run diorama, the Dagobah Yoda's Hut diorama, and the Trash Compactor diorama, they were not qualifying for these uh, free gifts with purchases. And, and so obviously a lot of LEGO Star Wars fans that have a lot of the older sets were hoping to grab the new sets, including the Land Speeder, in order to qualify for these gifts with purchases but weren't able to do so until later that the, uh, the back-end database was actually fixed that those products would qualify for it. Yeah, it was one of those frustrating situations where you don't know that the fine print just forgot to specify that the brand new sets didn't qualify towards the free gift or that somebody hadn't sort of coded the website right and so that only current available sets qualified 
and the new one suddenly sudden hadn't been added to the list. So it was one of those things. Do you order some old Lego to lock in the free gifts to make sure that you get them and then go back and buy the new Lego later or go and buy the new Lego in the hopes that they would f- retroactively fix it uh, before they ship your order and yeah. hope that they don't just sort of sell out of the free gifts before they go back and fix those ones. So there was a lot of scrambling in the local Facebook groups trying to figure out what was the best strategy people putting different things into their carts trying to figure out what the problem was you know finding which ones qualified which ones didn't and things like that so it was a fairly stressful thing I hope that Lego fans out there in New Zealand managed to not overspend or buy sets that you didn't particularly need or want to get those things I mean Lego's Lego you can generally resell it to get back a bit of your money but you don't want to be you know trying to offload some old set that you bought to get the freebies and then find that there's 20 other people on trade me trying to do the same thing so I hope that you all got the sets that you want. The, the the homestead kitchen is a really cute set. The sort of thing that, yeah, probably wouldn't appeal to a mass market if they put it on a store shelf, but I think it's a fabulous addition to a Star Wars collection. Very, very keen to get my hands on those new dioramas. I think they look amazing. And I think it was terribly frustrating for any Lego Star Wars fan that was desperately wanting to order those, but also wanted to make sure that they secured those free gifts. Because any of the free gifts that are technically not buyable do certainly gain in value later on. They do become quite collectible and sought after because they're generally not made in the same high quantities as the standard Lego range. So it was probably worth it to go and buy one of the standard sets to make sure you got those gifts because it seems like the diorama sets are available from a range of retailers are, yeah. all of the star wars day emails some that are coming are through reduced right now today. yes yeah. i'm seeing some of those are particularly uh just off the top of my head the the trench run and the Dagobah dioramas are currently on sale at Mighty Ape um, with some pretty good reductions, about 20, 15 to $20, $20 off. So for those sorts of sets, that's a pretty good reduction. And I guess some of these retailers know that these new product people are just going to go and get it no matter where. And so if you're technically cheaper than the competitors, then you'll get a, a good amount of the sales. Mighty Ape also does have a promotion. Yeah. Yeah, I was just about to head on to that. So the those GWP's Gusus purchase that I just mentioned, the Lars Homestead, you get that free from Lego.com with for purchases with purchases over two twenty nine and the Mandalorian Beskar keyring for VIP members free with Lego Stars purchases over one forty nine New Zealand dollars. Overseas there was a third gift with purchase, a small scale ATST. Didn't look like the local Lego store was going to cover that, but then surprisingly and interesting, it showed up at, at Mighty Ape, and I believe their threshold for giving that away free, you can choose it from quite a wide range of, of um, other Lego Star Wars polybag sets, is only a $50 purchase. Yes, so that was that was pretty good. Unfortunately, Mighty Ape doesn't have the hugest range of Lego. Possibly they sell out well. They don't have quite a back, it's lot, it's yes. back catalogue. Yeah. yeah, so there's a... There's a list to choose from there but But thankfully they have the new sets so if you ordered old sets to get the freebies from lego.com you can go and grab the dioramas from mighty ape on sale and qualify to get the the free gift the the cute little bagged atst figure so hopefully between all the different sort of vendors you can all grab the lego i'm all very very tempted by that beautiful land speeder i think that one is it's a really good price point for for the size of 339 340 bucks yeah i think and it's a classic Star Wars vehicle, you don't need to even collect Lego for that to look cool on your shelf, just a one-off piece. I, I mean, that's that's the beauty of the Ultimate Collector Series, isn't well, it? You can just buy the one thing and just have it standing somewhere on I've display. A, it looks I've cool. I've seen a few people, and I understand the point of view, because it is just a, an interesting sort of pink uh, family car in some ways um but i saw a few people you know bemoan a little bit that that was the choice for the next ucs product i personally love the original trilogy land speeders because the vintage kenner toll toys land speeder was the first star wars vehicle product i i ever owned so it has really really strong ties to the original trilogy and in, in my childhood for me so yeah i quite like this this ucs land speeder it's a really nice proportions it's a good looking product i think it's a good sort of uh, balance to the at 
that that's at such a high price yeah. point a lot of people that's going to take a bit of saving for the average collector and i think you can't come back in with something that's big and amazing straight after that so i think they're like okay if you couldn't get a hold of this or you're saving up for it here's the next one in the series it's a much more affordable piece even that people aren't hardcore lego collectors can afford to grab this piece you know it's, it's a it's more than a handful of pops yes but it's it's at a, a much more attainable price than the than the ad at which is up there you know it's beautiful it's amazing but it is very expensive for the average collector so i do get you can't just keep doing the most popular ones all the time you got to sort of balance it out um you know put some ones in there that the the that that maybe not 99 percent of the fans will get but there's still a reasonable amount of people that love it's an original trilogy it's from a new hope it's from the first film it's iconic it's you know one of the first vehicles we see in star wars so how can they not add it to the series and just one more thing on the topic of Lego that I want to throw into the mix. This hasn't actually shown up a lot online, so I'm not quite sure where it's going to go. But in the press release that we received regarding upcoming Lego products and Star Wars Day, they mentioned that they are soon to launch a few new SKUs to the Lego Star Wars range, including, they tell us, a couple of brand new helmets. So stay tuned to your ch local channels and to SWNZ to see if they're what those new helmets are going to be if you're um, into that that sub collection of Lego Star Wars items. I'm a fan of the Lego Star Wars helmets. I think they look really cool. I'm really excited to see where they go. There's a couple of original trilogy designs that they could add to the range. We've seen them branch into the Mandalorian. So it'll be interesting to see uh, whether we might see something like the Armorer's iconic helmet. We could see something like an like an at, -at pilot helmet. Uh, it, it'll be really interesting to see what they reveal. Okay, moving on to talk about Star Wars books for the keen readers out there the essential legends collection continues to grow these are of course as we've mentioned many times before reissues republications of older expanded universe novels with new cover art and a nice way to sort of recollect those older older books x-wing series continues with the kratos trap written by michael stackpole darth maul shadow hunter by michael reeves will be coming out in the next wave and also Death Troopers by Joe Schreiber, the only sort of Star Wars horror, it's, as it's sort of been described, it was followed up by Red Harvest in this sort of previous old Star Wars Expanded Universe. Death Troopers is kind of fun because for a brief moment there, that sort of uh, Stormtrooper zombie, there was even some products associated with that and a lot of costumes kind of got into that groove. I think it was a fun concept that people really liked the idea of. Yeah, it was fun. And I think there's some people that kind of wish that that concept had been continued or brought into the sort of the new era obviously death trooper the term now stands Twice for else, yeah. for the black uh troopers the sort of the elite squad that we see in rogue one of course if they were zombie troopers they they wouldn't have their own imperial designation but yeah i i still i love that book i think it was sort of like a real fun era where that came out you know it was fun seeing the costumers do their sort of zombie if you bunged up your stormtrooper armor you could just sort of like you know turn it into a zombie one and it looked it, you sort of resurrected your old broken armor and made it look awesome so it's definitely worth picking up and reading if you haven't had the opportunity to Okay, Pandora Jewelry has a new wave of Star Wars products, doesn't it? Yeah, Pandora have been doing Star Wars beads for a little while now. They had this, the Disney license for some years before they finally branched into Star Wars. They've done a fantastic range in a couple of different releases. And just before May 4th, they released four new items. Now, these are some really neat designs. Honestly, I think every one of these pieces is, is, a, is a hit. Um, so we have three charms. The first is a classic sterling silver Ewok. We have a white enamel Stormtrooper helmet. It looks really neat next to the previously released black enamel Darth Vader. Those two look really neat. And third in the charms, we have a beautiful sort of rose gold ribble bird symbol sort of spinner that's inside a sterling silver sort of holder. It has the word rebel written on one side and has beautiful blue stone accents on the back that look like stars. This one has a skinny sort of hanger ring. So it is designed to look nice on your bracelet, but it also looks beautiful when worn as a necklace pendant on a chain. In fact, on the Pandora website, you can even buy it as a bundle with just this charm 
on a matching sort of coordinated standard line necklace. The necklace isn't Star Wars, but they have paired the two together so that you can buy them so you can just wear it. I think that's a fabulous option. So if you want to get a really good bang for your buck, this charm can be worn as a necklace or added onto a bracelet. And of course, last but not least, we have a full Star Wars sterling silver bangle. This is an open bangle, comes in three or four sizes. So there's something for everyone there. And it has two sort of rounded ball ends. One of the one of the ends has the rebel bird symbol in blue stones, and the other end has the imperial cog symbol in red stones. Along the back of the bracelet, it says "May the Force be with you" engraved, and on the inside of the bracelet, it has two lightsabers pointing at it. This is fabulous. There is details all over it, but it still looks kind of subtle when worn on the wrist. I tried this one on in Pandora. It looks amazing. This one is just under one hundred and fifty dollars. Very worth while you can wear it just on its own but you can add beads on top of it if you really want to you can use it with the standard pandora star wars line but it makes a beautiful gift just on its own so i think that's a fabulous gift and for any um mothers out there that love star wars this is a fantastic uh choice out there seeing as mother's day is only a few days away that would be a fabulous gift i know i would love to get that for mother's day i think it's beautiful um you don't need to be a pandora fan it's just a beautiful sterling silver bracelet with some really thought really well thought out uh, star wars details on it so of course that's available through all branches of pandora stores around new zealand but you can also order it ships from within New Zealand, from the New Zealand uh, site, yes, Pandora website. They do offer free shipping within New Zealand if you spend over a certain amount. Most of the beads by themselves do not qualify for free shipping, but the bracelet does. So you can order that online and just get free shipping because it's over the uh, free shipping amount. So that's a, a great last minute gift. If you want to run into a store or buying it for yourself, you can buy it online. I know they ha we have passed the cutoff for delivery for Mother's Day for the online Pandora store but it's definitely worth checking out. I know for some of the previous releases, they put big banners in the window so that you knew that they had new stock. This one was a bit more subtle. They just put out emails and you could sort of go into the store and you can see them there alongside the other Star Wars beads. Let's talk about recently released and upcoming products from New Zealand Mint. They're continuing their run of Star Wars products, many products per month. A new battle scenes series begins with a Hoth battle featuring at hats ATSTs. Th comes in a three ounce silver coin priced at four hundred and seventy odd dollars with a mintage of a thousand dollars. That's available now. The Chibi coin line continues. Specifically for May the fourth, this month's release is C three PO. And interestingly, it's a silver coin, but they're referring to it as a gilded silver coin. It has a shiny gold plating, priced a little bit more than their standard chibi coins because of this gold plating, $188. Unlike recent other chibi coins where you have a premium version in the premium case, this is just available in the standard case. So one ounce of gilded silver C3PO chibi coin available for pre-order now. That's just come out overnight from Mary yesterday. This one's going to be really popular. Obviously, there has already been a lot of original trilogy characters. But not C-3PO. But yet. not C-3PO. So this one's kind of surprising. Obviously, it's kind of out of the blue. But I think you need to be on your toes if you are a Chippy Coin collector. They do – some of them sell blisteringly fast. Some of the sort of more recent ones, some of the sequel and Mandalorian uh, releases haven't sold out quite as quick. But the original trilogy ones always really do. It's easy to kind of stick to maybe that sort of subset of the – coins and they're really popular this one is very cute obviously it made perfect sense for nz mint to do this in a gold plating but obviously that does make him a bit more expensive interesting that they've decided to not do him in the standard line that this is a special out of the blue may 4th but then i guess we're in that age where every company is going to just surprise us with things on may 4th but he looks really cool so if you're a collector of those don't wait yeah, and coming up from New Zealand Mint in their sort of coming soon page, they've let us know that on the 6th of May there will be a Sandcrawler coin available in a 1 ounce silver, a 5 ounce silver and a quarter ounce gold version. So that's going to be their, sort of their classic line of coins. 20th of May we will see a new Darth Vader 3 ounce silver coin and later 27th of May this is interesting, a Bad Batch Hunter coin, one ounce of silver, that implies that we'll probably see a new Bad Batch collection with other members of Bad Batch following along in subsequent months. 
going to just round out our news reports with a couple of listings that relate to other discussions we've had in previous podcasts. From Funko, the Soda Pop Collections, there's a Jawa Soda Vinyl Collection, collectible with can. He is now available in New Zealand, or available for pre-order in New Zealand for $28. Put a link to the Mighty 8, but he's available wherever Funko products are sold. We talked a while back about the Hot Hasbro announcement of the Retro Collection Chewbacca Prototype figure. So this is the multicolor vintage style action figure that looks a bit like the prototypes that came out of the factory. No local retailers were spotted having him conveniently available, but you can grab it via Pop Culture in Australia for New Zealand $32, which I suppose is probably a reasonable price for a uh, sort of short run product like this. We've used Pop Culture once or twice, and I do recommend them as somewhere to look at if they if you're looking for something locally but can't find it exactly in New Zealand. They ship to New Zealand most products at a price point of about Australian twelve dollars fifty, which is you know pretty fair compared to some of the shipping rates within New Zealand. So that retro collection multicolored Chewbacca prototype, you can grab it from Pop Culture Australia for New Zealand thirty two dollars. Okay, that's about it for today's installment. I guess we're done doing talking just for now. We're going to follow up very shortly using a tactic we haven't used before with a podcast tomorrow to round out all the news that we're going to be getting from Star Wars Day and we'll talk about any other Star Wars product availability that we see locally in New Zealand. If you've got any thoughts on topics we discussed today, we're definitely keen to hear them. Leave a comment on the YouTube page or our website page for this podcast. Let us know what you did for Star Wars Day, May the 4th. Thank you for tuning in. We appreciate you taking your time to listen to us share our passion for Star Wars. Stay tuned to our website, swnz.co.nz, for Star Wars news for New Zealanders and another podcast first tomorrow, but thereafter, again, back to our schedule of every week. Don't forget, you can jump on over to either our Facebook group or the SWNZ message boards to discuss all the latest Star Wars news with other Kiwi fans. Kia ora, kia noho, haumaru. Thank you for listening and stay safe. Turo Hawaiki, may the force be with you. If you enjoyed today's podcast, go ahead and like the video, check out the SWNZ podcast playlist for our other episodes, and subscribe for alerts about new episodes. See you next time.